So, how do we explain deviation from ideal behavior? Well, first of all, let's understand what ideal behavior means, okay? So, remember we said uh, the limit of Z as P approaches zero at very low pressure, Z will, the value of Z is going to approach one. That's ideal behavior, right? And this is true regardless of what your gas is. Why doesn't the nature of the gas matter at very low pressure? In other words, why is PV equals NIP applicable regardless of what the structure of your gas is? It doesn't, doesn't seem to matter what, what kinds of atoms make up the molecules in your gas. The reason for that is at very low pressure, what do we know from the ideal gas law? At very low pressures, your molecules are very, very far apart, right? Very large intermolecular distances. In other words, they more or less move independently of each other. They are, there's negligible interaction between the molecules on average. Okay, so it doesn't matter what their structure is. It doesn't matter how strongly they might attract each other because they're so far away. Okay, so attractions and repulsions are negligible because the molecules on average are very far away from each other. So that's, that's the explanation for ideal gas behavior. Low, very low pressures, they're very far apart. It doesn't really matter what kind of molecules make up your gas. So that's why you have that one equation that uh, works for all gases. But what happens at intermediate pressures? Once you get these molecules a little bit closer, then you start to see deviations from ideal behavior. Okay? It's like saying that uh, if someone's very, very far away from you, okay, you have minimal interaction with that person. It doesn't matter if that person's gorgeous or ugly. Okay? But if it's a little closer, you know, you might see some attraction there. <laughs> and if the person gets too close for comfort, then you start to repel that person. You know? <laughs> All right. So experimentally, Z can be less than one. Why? Well, when the average distance between molecules are such that the attractive forces are no longer negligible, so if that person is close enough so you can now see how gorgeous that person is, <laughs> then you start occupying a smaller volume. So when, there's, when the distances, when the pressure is high enough so that the distance, average distance between the molecules is uh, such that attractive forces start to become important, okay, then if there's attractive forces, then that means the molecules will occupy a smaller volume than they would if they were just ignoring each other. So that, that would lead to Z being less than 1. So your volume is going to be less than ideal. Okay? Now, what happens? Is how can Z be larger than 1? Well, typically, Z becomes larger than 1 when you are at very, very high pressure. So you're trying to squeeze all these molecules closer together. Okay? So once your distance is at very high pressure, your distance, you're trying to squeeze your molecules into a very small volume, they now start to repel each other, okay? They're now, okay, it's like saying you're not, you're not invading into my personal space, okay? So we start to repel. And so when, you're, when the distances are such that repulsive forces start to predominate, the volume of the gas, okay, the molecules are going to spread out so that the volume of the gas would be larger than what it would be if they, if, they, if they were just to ignore each other. Okay, so that's what happens. That's how Z becomes larger than 1 at very high pressures. Okay? So here's a typical uh, graph that you can use to show how the compression factor depends on, compression factor Z depends on pressure. This is for carbon dioxide and nitrogen at 350 Kelvin, okay? Uh, which one do you think is carbon dioxide and which one do you think is nitrogen? This is a plot of Z versus pressure, okay? So increasing pressure here. Notice that as you go to very low pressure, what, num what value does the Z value approach at low pressure? What's this value right here? Z approaches one, okay? And so, as the pressure increases, it dips below one, okay? And this one dips a lot. Eventually, that's going to go back up. This one dips a little bit, and then it goes back up. So eventually, that Z exceeds uh, one at high, very high pressure. So let me see if you can reason out 
which one of this, which, which of these two, this is an, what do you call an isotherm, by the way. This is uh, it's constant temperature, okay? All of these data points are done at constant temperature, 350 Kelvin. So it's just Z versus pressure. So each one of these lines is called an isotherm. Each one of these curves, okay? Isotherm means every point on each of these curves was taken at constant, was, right, represents data at the same temperature. So which one is carbon dioxide and which one is nitrogen? So let's let's just say which one is carbon dioxide? Is it A or B? Uh, that's a uh, one-third, two-third split, huh? Okay, so correct answer is B. Why B? Well, what does a dip below one mean? When Z dips below one, what does it mean? Attractive forces. You're looking at uh, conditions where attractive forces are significant so that the gas occupies a smaller volume than it would if it were ideal, right? When Z equals 1 right here, that's, that's the ideal case. So why, does, why do you expect carbon dioxide to dip below 1 better than nitrogen at the same temperature? Then you'll have to compare carbon dioxide and nitrogen in terms of intermolecular forces. Okay? So how do you compare carbon dioxide and nitrogen in terms of intermolecular forces? Remember the Lewis structures for carbon dioxide and nitrogen? This is carbon dioxide and nitrogen. They're both nonpolar. So the only type of intermolecular forces that's going to be involved there would be what? For nonpolar uh, substances, what's the only type of intermolecular forces present? London dispersion forces. And what did we know about London dispersion forces? The larger the molecules, the more polarizable your electron cloud is. In other words, the bigger the air, the region where your electrons are moving around, the more likely you can have induced dipoles. Instant, you can have instantaneous dipoles. Okay? And so you have stronger attractive forces among carbon dioxide molecules as opposed to nitrogen molecules simply because of its size, okay? There's no dipole-dipole interaction here. Neither one of these is polar. There's no hydrogen bonding interaction. So the only source of intermolecular attractions here would be London dispersion forces, okay?